Greetings, friends. Welcome back to another episode of Dreamscapes. Uh, today we have our friend Kim from New Mexico. Hey, Kim, thanks for joining us. Hello, glad to be here. Wonderful. So I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping first. I always forget to tell people, hey, please like, share, subscribe, tell your friends. I always need more volunteers to share their dreams uh, with the audience. You can support my work by, hey, getting a t-shirt, uh, coffee mug, tote bag, links in the description below. Also direct donation links. If you just want to send me money, I am not going to refuse. Uh, also, please remember I have nine uh, currently available published works of historical dream literature available on Amazon.com, working on book number 10. And that's the housekeeping. I think I got it out in under 30 seconds and we're going to go back to uh, we're gonna go back to talking to Kim. So uh, as per my usual process, I'm just going to shut up and you're going to tell us your dream and I'm going to see if we can uh, we're gonna see if we can figure it out together okay um so uh, begin now the dream yes please anytime okay uh what from what i can remember i was go walking into Whoa. a <laughs> <house. Let's laughs> spill my coffee ah, we're gonna, oh man we're gonna leave that in we're gonna leave it in that's <laughs> It's part of the show already. <laughs> right? It is. Oh, really boy. This is, a, this is a hot mess. And that's, you know, I hope everyone's laughing at me right now because it's, it, laughter is wonderful. Please. <laughs> Please laugh that at me. Definitely kicked in. <laughs> now we're going to throw it over to our friend Kim and she's going to tell us about her dream and I'm going to try not to spill my coffee again. <laughs> Please. Please continue. <laughs> uh, I was walking into this massive house. I remember it just being completely white. And it was a house party. Um, I was there with a couple of quote unquote friends, just people that were with me at the time. Um, you know, everybody's enjoying their time, drinking it up, being social. And whenever I dream, I, I know that it's me myself, like in that dream, but I'm always in a like different body, if oh. that makes sense. Yeah, I'm in a different body, but I know that it's me. Um, then after some time being there, um, I'm walking out the door again, and I feel something crawling inside my body, like inside my arm, my forearm to be exact. And I look down by my elbow, and there's two like little squiggly um, beans in there, and what I assume to be leeches two leeches in there and I'm like screaming, no, get them out, get them out, get them out. And nobody is moving. Nobody is saying nothing. It's just me screaming, <laughs> losing it, being hysterical and feeling these little tiny leeches inside of me. And they're just crawling up my arm towards my wrist. And then I wake up. But okay. then I wake up with the sensation of like something moving in my arm and I looked and nothing was there. <laughs> you did in that transition from fully asleep to kind of waking awareness, you yeah. still had kind of a sensation. Yes. But then when you looked, you didn't see anything on your skin. No, I just saw like the outline, the outlining of these tiny beings, these leeches inside of me. You kind of had that after image. In, in, that, yeah. in that in that um, transition state, what did what did Mary Ar Arnold Forster call it? Uh, the border borderland state, I think, is what she called it. That's uh, that's book six, Studies and Dreams. You can get it on Amazon. <laughs> um, when you did you ever identify a physical source of of a sensation? You know, wrinkles in your blanket or um, crackers you were eating in bed that might have been itching your skin? Anything like that? No, nothing whatsoever. Okay. Fair enough. Just just checking on that. Um, that's it's actually not an uncommon experience on on both sides of things where physical sensations in, in that in that borderland state that transition from sleeping to waking, there are physical sensations our body experiences as we come back towards waking consciousness that can influence the end of dreams, um, but it's also the other way around where we those those sensations carry over from our dream experience and we think it's still happening and and there's something in that that's related to um the sleep paralysis phenomenon too where people come awake but their body is still in that lo locked out of their physical state, yeah. physical senses um experiencing their physical senses but not under volitional control and then that's where they get 
um, I've, I've mentioned this before, but it's always so fascinating to me and I never know which video people are going to watch. So I, I say the same thing over and over again sometimes, but the sensation of say when sleep paralysis and, and this, this sensation that something's sitting on your chest and you can't take a breath is because your lungs are disconnected from your volitional choice to draw a breath. They're in auto, auto sleep mode where the lungs just breathe on their own. Um, so that's actually a real physical phenomenon connected to that. I hope to never experience Ooh. that. I really do. Like that's one of my fears is just not being able to move, yeah. but I am consciously awake. Yeah. That I fortunately I've never experienced it. And I, there's, there's gotta be research and I'm going to find it one of these days about the connection between perhaps people that have those sleep paralysis experiences oh. and people who lucid dream and whether there's crossover or, or some connection, if they're, if they're separate phenomenon or if they're related to the, to the same bodily, there's so much we don't know about dreams. Uh, I know. And the process, yeah. And the process of dreaming, not just understanding what they mean, but how it works. Um, which is part of why I'm on this journey. Well, honestly, is I've just always been fascinated by it. I, I tend to not remember my dreams. So, um, I get into, these conversations with people and they tell me about them and we figure it out together, but I'm always like, I'm always blown away. I'm like, these are amazing experiences. <laughs> right. There's so much that we do not know like whatsoever. And especially that people can lucid dream. That just boggles my mind. Right. That's amazing to me. I mean, I don't, I don't think I've ever experienced that. Pretty sure not. I do remember one, one dream I'll, I'll get into it at some point and explain it. And it seemed like I knew it was a dream, but it was ex so extremely short. Uh, like, five seconds it was and i don't even know if it really counts i'm not sure yeah wow. <laughs> um yeah some, someday i'll <clears throat> get on to that speaking of getting on with it um we're gonna go back through this one more time and see if we can uh figure figure out some additional details so um you it, uh, the first thing you remember in the dream is walking into a house do you remember a approaching the house from the street or just suddenly you're in the space with the people no suddenly in the space with the people okay and that's also very common too um that dreams seem to have like um video edit jump cuts where we just now we're somewhere yeah. else and and that 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 can be the start of a dream dream's got to start somewhere why would you <laughs> why why would you suddenly appear in the house and not in the front yard you just did um right. but I just wish they were more like a movie you know like yeah. everything fluidly connected yeah fades <laughs> fades in from black inside house party done that's that's how it works um so you said um, one of the mo. Where, where were you standing in the room when when you appeared? Like as if you had just walked in the front door. Yes, just as I had appeared in the, I mean, yeah, in the doorway in the room, and I could see the whole room, and I just see people in like random places on the couch, by the window, um, even by a kitchen counter. Do you have any strong impression of? what any particular person was doing i mean talking to each other maybe but any any behaviors um just i could just see um just a couple of people sitting and bringing a cup to their mouth like okay. drinking but they were also kind of talking to each other talking and drinking yes okay they might have been silent. That might have been an interesting fact. So I'm going to do something I call rattling doorknobs. I, I ask you something. You don't have a memory of it or it didn't happen. Just tell me, nope, uh, and we'll, we'll move on. Probably going to ask a lot of irrelevant questions. <laughs> so as, as I said before, I'm happy to be wrong if it gets us where we're going. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so did any of them take notice of your presence when you walked in? Did anyone make eye contact, come to greet you? No. Okay. Everybody was just doing their own thing. It was as if I wasn't even there. Even the people that I was with, um, I kind of lost them. Yeah. What was, but your, I was, what was your impression of the people you were with as you walked in? Where were they? Behind you? In front of you? Um, beside me. Okay. Do, do you have uh, an impression of how many there were and who they were? 
I would say like three people, three people beside me, um, one on my right side and then the other two on my left. But no, I did not get a sense of like if I was familiar with them, I just knew that they were somehow my friends. Okay. So no, not, uh, not specific persons. And, no. and when you mentioned friends the first time through, you gave it, I, I, I heard air quotes as if these people were friends, but not friends. Did, did I, did I get that impression? Yeah, you right? heard that correct. Yeah. Um, and what that? I think yeah. that I, yeah, I was just aware or I just knew somehow that they were my friends, that I was there with them to this party, but I, I don't know who they were. I was not able to see any faces. I don't see, I hardly see any faces whenever I dream. Fair enough. That's also pretty common. Uh, or rather, the idea that certain features of it, not seeing faces is very common, but also if you don't tend to see faces, then that tends to be a consistent phenomenon of across multiple dreams there's there's different uh and we, we can get into why uh possibly we'll see if we can figure that out too why why oh, yeah. would that be missing for you because some that. people see faces very clearly and it's a very uh striking impression to them um but right more more than that so so with the air quotes on the friends it was more like you had the impression they were friends but you didn't know who rather than suspecting they weren't actually friends i wasn't sure right. which way the air yeah. quote was going yeah, I know. Yeah, I just somehow knew that they were my friends, but not necessarily uh, could see their face or knew or um, actually friends that I have in real life. Okay, gotcha. That's good. Good point of clarification. And then, um, at what point did you did did you see them leave, or the, uh, was it so, at some point later that you noticed they were missing? How how did that kind of play out? Um, it's kind of like that, um, just video jumping from one scene to the next. I am, they were nowhere around me. I did not see them like walk away from me. Okay. We'll probably, yeah. we can come back around to that. Yeah. So you're standing just having entered this room. If you had to give it a guesstimate on the, the size of the room, you said massive. So we're talking, 20 by 30, 50 by 80, football field size. How, how would you kind of qu quantify that that interior space? Um, let me see. I would say kind of like um what? It's a hard one cuz you're yeah. thinking of a comparison. <laughs> like it's it wasn't an apartment foyer and it wasn't no. a even, no, even the standard a, um like yeah. Like mansion size. So we're yeah. <clears throat> okay. If you, in, in your memory, if you kind of look around and you said there was a couch, there was a window, there was a kitchen counter. Do, do you notice any other features? Was the staircase going to a second level? Uh, was, was there a fireplace? Any other details like that pop into your head? No, I, um, the kitchen counter was on the right side, uh, more towards the back wall of this room. And then the couch was, in the center of the room and then the window was slightly on the left of that couch but i would say the couch and the wall were like six feet apart no um 10 feet apart yeah just 10 feet apart from the wall and the couch okay so the kitchen area kind of in the back and then a couch by a window um, but they were separated. So you had distinct clusters of, of people. If you had to guess or kind of count heads, how many people would you say were there? 10, 20, 50? Um, I would say like 17 people. Okay. So um, not huge, uh, you know, not uh, stadium crowd in a concert, but not intimate exactly. Just, just, outside of where maybe you would know everyone in a certain friend group uh and you didn't know any of the people there actually they, they were all strangers to you as far as you could tell or how did you feel yeah they were all strangers any features stand out about them more more men or more women um any any clothing d description etc anything pop out um it was more like 
clothing for cold weather, I would say. Not winter, but fall, I would say, yeah. Okay. And there was, I would say, just an equal amount of men and women. But I do vaguely, distinctively remember this one woman um, sitting on the couch, and she was looking towards the right side, talking to somebody, but I didn't see who she was talking to. I just... My main focus was on her, and I remember she had shoulder-length hair, and that it was kind of like a dirty blonde type of color, okay. and she had like, red lipstick on. When you think about her, does anything come to mind? Any any people you've known or experiences you've had? Just throwing, mm. throwing it out there. Just that she was somehow familiar and friendly. Mm. I like these questions. Very good questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. You are, uh, this is, this will be what my 56th interview, 50 episode 56. Uh, I hope by the time I hit a thousand, I'll actually be good at this. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you know, <laughs> so, go away. Yep. <laughs> um, so that's right there in the very, very first, um, kind of opening scene. Um, you did mention something else that I, well, any, any other details that come to mind now that you're kind of thinking about being in that space, any, anything else that seems relevant or, or irrelevant, who knows, just anything. Um, no, nothing else comes to mind. Just that it was very quick, very brief. Um, as I walk in and I, I would say like maybe 15 to 30 minutes in there. And then I noticed myself at the doorway again but then as bef i'm still inside the room yeah and as i'm about to walk out i feel something inside of my arm something tickling me yeah so there's there's a span of time between and that's what i wanted to do is kind of fill in that gap <clears throat> a little bit between what happens before you walk in and what ha and then the, the the end of the dream with the with the leech experience so do you remember doing anything in that space? Did you go to the kitchen, to the couch? Did you, was was it then almost immediately you noticed your friends are gone? Yeah, um, it was just immediately. No time in between. But you had a sense that some time had passed? Yes. Okay, that's interesting. It was, a, so the jump cut involved knowing time had passed. Yes. Any Any sense of what you did during that time? I mean, was it as if you stood at the doorway just watching people for 30 minutes? <laughs> no. Um, I kind of felt myself going clockwise around the room and speaking to these people, like socially, just having small talk, okay. but not um, necessarily staying in one spot and then speaking to certain people. Gotcha. It was just me, like me, and it was just me and myself, not those friends yeah. that I came in with. It was just me walking, like going from people, not a group of people to the next group of people. It's very interesting that, uh, yeah, it was when you started to socialize that those friends who had come with you, that you noticed they were absent. So you arrive with friends in the beginning, and but but then this social uh, we make social circle you said clockwise makes me think of a circle uh this socializing experience a small talk and whatnot the presence of friends is is gone uh that's i don't know what that means uh, but, but i put a little carrot next to stuff where it's like what is what's going on there like if you very well could have dreamed they were with you the whole time uh that would mean something else but their absence seems to say something as well um you said clockwise so that would have taken you maybe over towards the window and then in the couch area first, like towards that woman that felt familiar and comfortable? Yes. Do you, um, do you remember talking to her? No, I did not talk to her whatsoever. I did not approach that couch whatsoever. It was more going around the couch, beside the couch, and then behind the couch, and then again beside that couch. And then I'm at that doorway once again. So and you made I, a circuit of the room you went, you went past the kitchen area too? Mm, yeah, you, past. 
Uh-huh. And you don't remember any subjects of conversation, uh, any how you were received. The people were friendly. They were cold. Uh, how would you describe that? Um, just familiar. So you did feel like um, a, a certain familiar com- comfort in a way with these people. Uh, they didn't feel threatening. You, you were welcome there. Right. Yeah. Okay. But not too friendly. Just familiar. But um, as I'm at that doorway again, like exiting, like leaving that party, um, I do remember having those friends again, but they were behind me. They were behind me. Um, One was beside me on my left. But they did not approach me whatsoever, like not. And you don't remember um, having sure. interactions with those friends who came with you at all? No, what, no, none whatsoever. Okay. So there's, uh, so you finished your circuit. You, you came to the party, you did the thing, you, you made the rounds, uh, li- literally in, in this sense. And then it was as you're approaching the door to leave that you had the, the leeches experience. Yes. Okay. And it, I do um, remember looking at my right arm. It was your and it right was arm. Forearm. Yeah. Yeah. And you described it. <clears throat> let me see here. Uh, as you're walking out the door, you, you feel, what was the sensation you felt before you looked? So there, there was something that drew your attention. What, what, what did it feel like? Um, something tickling me. Tickling my forearm. And if I like hold up my my forearm, is it on the uh, underside with the palm, or is it uh, top somewhere? Uh, where would you the say the first it? one uh, with the palm? Yes, like that. Where where would you say it? Uh, it was at closer to the elbow. Right there. Yes. Right, right, right there. there. Okay. Good. Closer deal. to the elbow. Yeah. So anyone who's listening on the podcast, you'll have to watch the video to see what I'm doing. <laughs> watch, watch, watch them both. They're fantastic. <laughs> I'm, I am so full of myself today. I feel, I'm feeling good. I'm probably over caffeinated. I wanted to make sure I was awake for you. Well, it is a Friday. <laughs> Pick right? start the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Damn right. Um, <clears throat> so you felt a little tickled. And then how did you, how do you remember analyzing the, the situation? Or did you have any, any thoughts or emotions at that moment? Were, were you um, feeling anything as you were going to leave the party in general that might have immediately preceded the tickle? Uh, I think, like, it was something bad, something wrong. Yes, something wrong. As I just felt that something was off and something was wrong, like not okay. And then I felt the sensation, like the tickling. And I just remember feeling fear, like that some, like I had already a premonition that something was inside of my body. And then I look and then I see the outline, just the outline of the leeches inside. So it's what kind you, of like, oh, go ahead. Um, I don't know if you've seen uh, The Mummy, like the movie The Mummy. Oh, yeah. And those um, beetles are inside the body and then they're just crawling inside of yeah. the person um arm face it's like that okay yeah that's what i was gonna gonna clarify is that they were under the skin but you could see like the raised bump as they're moving yeah yeah so um you said there were two of them distinctly two distinctly two yes okay and they were um side by side paralleling each other as they move or were they each kind of doing their own thing uh well, they each were kind of doing their own thing um one was above and then the other one was below okay almost as if one was following the other in, in a way but not precisely yes like okay. that and they were moving if you'd see uh they were moving say up, up towards your wrist yes and were they actual kind of leech size you know like an inch long or were they no, they were tiny. Um, I would say like the size of a ladybug. Okay. So maybe something that um, anyone around you wouldn't necessarily easily see if, if 
unless it was brought to their attention? Right, yeah. Okay. Do you recall your friends having any reaction to this at that moment when you noticed it or any awareness of what they were doing? No, they. I just remember that they were um, behind me. Okay. But they did not approach me whatsoever, did not offer any sort of help, these friends. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, <laughs> so you, uh, there was a moment where, you know, um, the next thing you're screaming, scream for help. Uh, but right. So right. Let's get the process in my head. Right before this, you had a sense of dread. Then you felt the tickle. Uh, then you looked the moment you saw them. How did your emotional state change from that impending doom to. Um, I was terrified. Like I could not believe that they were inside of my body. Cause I just thought that something was on the surface of my forearm, but then I looked and they were actually inside and I could feel them just going up towards my wrist. Okay. Any pain associated with it? Was it no, not just painful? the tickling. Yeah. Just the tickle. I mean, that's good. I wouldn't want you to experience that, but that would actually be a different kind of experience. So that might, um, might also be relevant. I'm making all kinds of little carrots here. People can't see my papers all <laughs> washed out <laughs> white. <laughs> um, so how, f well, how far did they get before you kind of freaked out and started yelling for help? Um, they got towards the middle of my forearm before I started uh, screaming out for help to get them out. I just remember saying, get them out, get them out, get them out. But nobody, you know, was coming to my aid. Sorry if I'm quiet here a moment. Everyone listening on the podcast, I'm writing furiously, furiously. And then, so it was halfway, you started yelling for help. And as they were approaching the wrist is when you woke up. Yes. Okay. Did you take any action? I mean, were you holding your hand? Were you trying to grab them to keep them from moving? Or were you just staring at it in shock? What was your like physical response? Uh... I think I want to say that I had a like this knife a blade had appeared in my left hand oh. and as I was trying um as I was approaching my arm and then the tip of that blade touched my arm I woke up okay that's that's an amazing detail. Did you remember that the first when you were given the first description, or it just it just came to you now? No, it just came to me now. Yeah, that's why we that's why we do the deep dive. That's why we go through it again. Yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. So you were gonna you were gonna cut them out. Get yeah, them out. I was so gonna cut them out. Oh, yeah. I was prepared to just get them outside of my body. Oh, that's what I also remembered that. I had this feeling that they just had to be out. I had to take them out, like to whatever um, extreme, they just had to be outside of my body. They could not stay in. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if we think of it in the, in the purest physical terms, um, let's say you're awake and something's crawling under your skin, I would cut that fucker out. <laughs> Well, yeah. <laughs> what the hell is this? That reminded me of um, two things. We, we spoke um, the mummy, and that was a pretty horrific scene. The, the Beatles, ugh, that, I hate, I hate that almost more than anything. That reminded me of another I, movie. Oh, go ahead. No, yeah, I was just gonna say that it made my skin crawl watching that scene. Well, oh, for sure, for sure. Well, that, that also reminded me of. You ever see a movie called The Ruins? I think it was called The Ruins. They go to some place in Mexico. Is it in the forest? What's that? Oh, no, no, that's a different movie. My bad. That was the ritual, I think, not the ruins. Oh, Other 
Yeah. <clears throat> well, this one is um. So the uh, kids on vacation, they go to some somewhere uh, deep jungle in Mexico, South America, somewhere, and they're just gonna go exploring for the day, and they come across this little old deserted pyramid kind of buried in, in the brush. And this one guy tries to shoot at them and chase them away. And they go in there and um, spoilers, uh, there's like a living carnivorous plant that, that dwells in that and people get infected by it and it crawls under the skin, like vines inside the body. <sighs> That's that all this kind of body horror stuff. Okay. No, I, don't believe, I believe, I don't think I've seen that movie. Okay. And there was another one where, um, because that's one one variety of the, of a similar experience, and these are kind of universal. Um, so small tangent, I'll, I'll come back. But uh, the, one of my favorite books from years ago is it, there's a series called Blank and Philosophy. So baseball and philosophy, uh, The mm -hmm. Simpsons and philosophy. Well, one one of those was The Undead and philosophy, and it goes through the idea of why we have these iconic say movie monster representations, the vampire, the Frankenstein, the werewolf, um, and what it says about ourselves, how, how humans can go wrong, uh, behaviors that are, um, say a vampire would be, uh, a psychic or physical, someone who preys upon another sucks their life energy out by manipulation, by, you know, financial predatory, sexual predatory behavior. These are all vampires. And then, uh, Werewolves would be more along the line of people behaving like in an animalistic, violent, f unpredictable fashion. When are they going to transform into this other person, this other monster like thing? So these are all iconic. And and this is also iconic as well. This this idea of the body horror of things crawling under the skin. There's things inside that we don't want there. And that relates to yeah. psychology and philosophy as well, because there are very often things inside of us that we don't like we self-reflect and we say, I don't like that part of me. I don't want it in there. And, uh, so very often this type of dream is going to have something to do along those lines. Um, just me mentioning that and kind of draw, drawing that parallel and putting it out there. Do any thoughts occur to you? Um, maybe, uh, the thing that comes that stands out is, since leeches, you know, they suck our blood. Mm -hmm. I feel like it was something referring to um, my life. And I don't know, like my energy being sucked out of me. Yeah. Maybe leeches were representing, I don't know, people in my life just draining me and that I needed to cut them out. Yeah. Yeah, that is, <clears throat> you know, on, honestly going through this, that is because leeches are so iconic of that type of, you know, uh, dr draining, predatory, uh, it's, it's sucking something out of me and, and also like an involuntary thing. You know, you don't, well, people used to put leeches on other people on purpose for medical reasons. Once upon a time, that was, uh, they thought they, oh no, I forgot to turn off my fan. Oh, there's going to be all this hum in the background forever, but it's gone now. Oh, there we go. <laughs> mm. Can't believe I forgot that. Well, I spilled my coffee and I'm talking too much. All of this. It's all this. Welcome. <laughs> welcome to Dreamscapes. This is how it goes. <laughs> um, iconic leeches, blood sucking. Uh, oh, there was, oh, I was going to mention one other thing. There was another movie where someone had used... Someone was able to use, say, psychic powers or something to trick someone into thinking that there was something under their skin and they needed to cut it out. But it was really. Yes. Do you remember some movie like that? Um, no, I, I do not. But I, it sounds familiar. Might have been an anime. Actually, it might have been. An, I think it was an anime. <laughs> someone was able to use this psychic power to trick someone into thinking something was crawling under the skin, and she was going to cut it out until someone stopped her. And it really, it really, it would have just been her slicing her own wrist. No, it was a movie. It was a movie, and it was like a ghost story type of movie. And she was on the basement stairs, trying to escape. It God. sounds so familiar it does. to me, but. It Hip on my tongue. I can't. Yeah, I don't know what it was, but it's yeah. It's one of those. I love those kind of surreal. Yeah. Is this? It was. It was the movie where it was the Japanese suicide forest movie. 
and she came oh, back. Oh yes, right? that one. Yeah, that right. one. she came back. Yes. And, yeah, she that was it. Me. Oh no, they were in the house. Yeah, in the basement. Yeah, yeah, they'd actually brought that ghost day. presence yes. or whatever, or the whole house basement thing was an illusion. You never know with those movies. It's so Japanese yes, do the horror, right? They're not looking for a happy ending. Those people like, and everybody dies. Thanks for coming to our movie. <laughs> <Woo>. <laughs> Oh, those are. Why do I do that to myself? Those are horrifying experiences, and I, I will watch another horror movie at some point. We, it's, like, it's almost like we can't help it. Scared. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so going back through this a little bit, so you, I think we want to hang on to that idea you said. That's why I write these things down. I talk too much, my brain goes all over the place. <laughs> the idea of people in your life, and there's very another another broad theme that suggested itself to me was the entire dream is a social experience you are going to a house party other people you you interact with other people and it's as you're leaving that you have the leech experience so when you think of when you think of that kind of theme to the story arc uh, being being your social life does that make a little more sense or does that bring bring any thoughts to mind yeah that does make a little sense um i do have trouble in social situations and sometimes after i'm through with that interaction um i feel drained just tired would like i'm not meant to be social would, <laughs> or would you consider yourself more of a introvert like to be alone uh yeah i consider myself that uh, to be an introvert um, I don't socialize unless I have to, or I genuinely um, enjoy that person's presence. Yeah. So uh, broadly speaking, and a lot of, and a lot of people may not know this. Here, here goes the uh, uh, psychological lecture part again. Uh, so a lot of people think introvert means shy, and there's Venn diagram style. There's overlap between those two behaviorally presented but you know shy is 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 a different category of thing it's like such high anxiety that you have a hard time expressing yourself it's a little little different category of thing what introvert and extrovert actually are is how you charge your battery in relation to social experiences so uh the extrovert it's not just about being loud and enjoying being the center of attention introverts can do that too it's more about if an extrovert spends too much time alone that's they they feel bad about that it's and and they they that is draining to them how they recharge their batteries is talking to people fills fills them up they're like oh this is wonderful like ah, i couldn't wait to go talk to somebody i need that interaction that there's something about that chemistry of two people talking that charges the extrovert's battery opposite for introverts that social interaction drains the introvert and they have to go be alone to recharge they they recharge yeah. in silence and isolation um and neither neither mode is necessarily healthy or unhealthy and neither one is superior to the other it's bi biological basically just born that way um whether your battery drains or or charges by social interaction so this is making a lot of sense too on the aspect that uh I had I had a whole point to that thing. I was coming back. I was coming back <laughs> around to it. Uh, um, well, I'm just going to stop there. What do you think? What do you think about that? I gave you a description, and now you're thinking about that in context of your dream. What 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 came to mind? Um, yeah, um, I always grew up with um, being shy or like being an introvert, just having a bad connotation to it. That we're just supposed uh -huh. to be lively all the time. But, um, and I just, I just hate being associated with that word, being shy. Like, I feel like I am intentional with who I share my energy with, not necessarily shy or reserved. Yeah. Just intentional. Yeah. Yeah, very much so. I, and uh, I am a very much introvert type of guy. I mean, I, I don't seem to have much of a problem talking to people. I can handle most, well, social situations are funny. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So if you're like, Hey Ben, you want to come over on Friday and just sit on the back patio and have a beer? I'm like, probably not going to do that. No. But if you say, Hey, 
Ben, I'm building a fence and can you just help me pour some concrete? I'm there. Let's do it. If there's, <laughs> I am a, I am a task oriented socializer. If we're there to do a job, I can talk to you all day. Kibitz mishmash. As long as we're doing something, if I'm just yeah. sitting there in a chair and I'm supposed to make small talk, I don't know what the, I feel put on the spot right there. Put on the spot is exactly right. uh, How am I supposed to perform here? I don't know. I literally don't know what to do. That's extremely stressful for me. So that that resonates with you? Yes, that so resonates. Yeah. That so there's also something to this idea that you've got as as you said, a negative connotation from your past. You feel based on how you were raised, your friend group, your your immediate surrounding culture, society, however you want to phrase it, that there's an expectation for you to be more extroverted that that the the culture around you in, in however you you understand that seems seems to pressure you in that direction yes um i was always under the impression that i had to be uh ready to socialize and be around people and just enjoy being surrounded by people all the time mm. and never actually got and that being alone was associated as something wrong with you. Um, that it's too weird to be by yourself. Like, why would you enjoy being by yourself? Yeah. Dad, and I forgot to turn off my phone. I forgot to do just everything this time. <laughs> I'm getting messages. Got a little too excited, too eager. <laughs> Dude, uh, I know. Well, this, oh, my prescriptions ready wonderful uh all right let's turn this off volume all the way down phone off shush go away all right yeah no i mean that makes a great deal of sense in in context to to this dream so you're if we, if we go with kind of a story arc and i do that i do this all the time i talk about the story what is what is what what is the story your brain is telling you and what is our brain doing our brain's processing ideas concepts trying to puzzle things out that we've experienced in our waking life and give, give us an answer, give, give us a better picture of what we're looking at sometimes, but also try and help us understand what, what we're looking at. And then when we understand what it is better, we can decide what to, what to do about it. Um, <clears throat> so the story arc of this dream seems to be your brain saying, okay, imagine you're, you're at a place where socializing is expected and imagine you do what you're supposed to supposed to do in that situation. But, but the moment you go to leave this, it it triggers the response of the leeches thing under the skin. You have this, this, this almost traumatic experience that seems to be associated with separating yourself from a social situation. If I phrase it like that, does, does anything come to mind? Yeah, um, you got it right on the dot. Like, what, what did I get? I hear something in your voice. I do. I love. I, you, you had a light bulb moment, huh? Uh, just the expectation uh, of just being in social situation of coming together and actually having something to say. Mm. But what if you know most of the time you don't have anything to say or don't want to say anything? And I have, I feel like growing up, that was always such a pressure put on to me to just be this social butterfly mm-hmm. and always wanting to be around people and always wanting to talk to people. Yeah. But I just, I, I feel like my alone time is sacred and I, that's what I need to, to recharge. And for sure. With having my family, that always seemed like it was something wrong. Like I was not supposed to do that. Like that was just out of character for me. And they always wondered why I just wanted to be alone. Now, now knowing that this, you've identified a, a pattern of uh, in your in your life that goes back. Pretty, pretty far, I, I would imagine, because you. Well, I mean, when when you're uh, born an introvert or extrovert, that's just your style, and you you can kind of see it from a very very early age. Did you have a recent experience immediately prior to this dream that related specifically to showing up to a social event or an argument with someone about 
interactive style and time spent alone was, can you think of some triggering experience during, you know, the, the week prior to having the dream maybe? No, nothing really comes to mind. It's just that, um, just that being alone meant that you were just an antisocial and just hated the world. Mm. Do you have an event coming up soon that you're considering not attending a family event or wedding or birthday? Um, there is an event tomorrow and I like, I do plan on going there. I just try not to think too much about the social interaction part. Cause then I kind of like psych myself out of it yeah. and then just not wanting to go, but it's a family event. If you, oh my god these family events they were so oh my god they were so stressful for me now that i'm putting it together yeah do i hated going to these family social events because i had to be someone that i'm not or yeah i had just to become a completely different person you gotta like, change, change yeah. what would be natural behavior for you and try to conform maybe to, to the expectations of the group you're in. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so when you when you think about anticipating going to that event and having this dream, do do does, does something start to overlap in your mind? Connecting this dream with that anticipation of going to this event, family event? <sighs> Um, I'm losing my voice here. So uh, I yeah, I believe so that it does overlap. But I had this dream earlier in the week, and then I didn't find out about this event until after the dream. Uh, yeah, after the dream. Well, fair enough. Then it would not necessarily be connected. Um, but it is an interesting coincidence. I, mean, I don't know. How do we phrase that? Two things. <laughs> Interest. Ooh, spooky woo coincidence. You have this dream to get you ready to start thinking about that problem. But other side of it is this is a recurring theme in your life. It might be connected to something else or just that there's, there is usually some kind of waking life experience that brings this around for your sleeping mind to process. And it's usually something that happened in the immediate daytime before you sleep. Not always, uh, cause it can be a longer, longer thing, but sometimes it's the week before, sometimes it's anticipating an event, but if you didn't know about it yet, uh, that would be completely wrong. Is it, is, is it okay to say what it is? Is, is oh, it like this a birthday or yeah, the event? Um, it's a baby shower, baby shower. Yeah. Did you, did, did you know anything about that being likely? I don't want to hang on to that too tightly, but it, uh, it's, it's such a great mm -hmm. connection. I'm hesitant to let it go. It's probably my brain. <laughs> no, I don't know. I, I didn't know that it was going to, that it was coming so soon. Fair enough. Yeah, no, that's okay. That's okay. And it doesn't have to, we don't know. We may never know what specifically triggered it. Sometimes, especially with long running patterns, it can just be, it comes back to your mind every now and again. How do I, yeah. how do I handle this type of situation? So what does that say about why the leeches and, and you specifically your, your experience with it too, that they were. So what was your experience with it? You get to this, the end of this social situation where you've behaved, performed as expected. Um, in in that uh, you know, what is he met met the expectations of the situation social you're expected to be socialized you know um but it's it's going to leave so that there's something about leaving social situations that is that provoked this response it wasn't the leeches didn't show up when you got there they didn't show up while you're talking to people all those things were fine it's this le act of leaving and j just to go back into the dream for a moment what do you remember why you were leaving? Was was there a sense of uh, I've done what I came yeah. here to do? Uh, thank God yeah. I'm out of here. Or how how did you feel about that? It was just time to leave. That's just what I got. That it was time to go. No specific reason for leaving that you can think of or recall. No. Okay. Yeah, I'm just done. I came here what I came here to do, and now I'm leaving. Yeah. So it is, it is that leaving it's, and it's a separation 
um, you know, it's ending. It's an ending of the experience. There's, there's some kind of, and, and you've, you've, we've gone all around it, but I don't think we've quite captured it yet. There's, there's something in your mind where you, you've internalized maybe that again, throwing this out there, happy to be wrong. Um, in, internalized some of these messages from throughout your life where leaving a social situation, the act of leaving, the act of that separation is, is triggering this negative experience that you want to, uh, it's almost as if, I don't know, in, in my brain, I keep thinking that the leeches like represent, again, a part of you that you want to cut out, that, that, mm-hmm. that you're not comfortable having inside. That's a negative, it's a negative, it's leeches, get them out. But it's, but it's actually... A, a part of a part of you that you're uncomfortable with. If if I kind of phrase it like that, how would you? Would does that bring anything to mind, or do you connect any dots for you? Um, I always associated leaving uh, social situations as um, inadequacy, like mm-hmm. that I wasn't able to perform as. I guess as I was expected um, for myself and external forces such as people. Yeah. But yeah, leaving was always a hard time to do. Yeah. Like, being hard to do. Like, how do I close this interaction? Like, how? Yeah. Is, how do I make it stop? Or like, how do I end it? I I feel that too. I I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how to do that. I have no idea. Like, um, and, and th- this is something happens when I'm talking on the phone, say with my parents is they'll call to tell me one thing. We'll talk for 30 minutes about all kinds of stuff and we'll repeat ourselves multiple times. And I think part of that is, especially when I'm talking to my dad, neither one of us knows how to say goodbye on the phone. It, it, we don't want it, it. We don't want it to be too sudden, but you never know when you've said enough and, and, do I, am I cutting him off? Did he have something else to say? Should I listen a little bit longer? Should, I, I almost feel like I need a script. <laughs> to, to exactly. Do that. exactly. That's, that's and, why I take notes. Of, well, I don't know. I always dread these, these moments, these closing. Um, yeah. Yeah. Just, I don't know. What is the nice way to say, like, I'm done here. Like, <laughs> I don't want to contribute anymore. I know. Yeah. And, and so I'm like legit diagnosed autistic, but not far enough that I, that I can't like present myself as you, as you, as you see me here, there's, um, it's, it's a little bit different, but I almost envy some of the folks who, uh, the people with more, more, I don't want to say more severe autism, but there's, there's a certain type of person where they're just like, I'm done here now and I'm leaving and they turn around and walk away and they never think twice about it. They just, just a sudden announcement and gone, uh, very, they're, they're done and out. I agonize more over it. <laughs> right. <laughs> And I just worry about what the other person might think or how the other person might feel. Yeah. And was I rude? That, uh, I, don't, I wasn't trying to be. Yeah. Oh, I was, I th- sorry. I, th- I talked over you and then I thought I lost you. Sorry. Oh, <laughs> no. Uh, yeah. Sip of my coffee there. Yeah. So there's very much something in that anxiety of separation say but not not exactly separation anxiety but that ending of a social situation that's bringing these this leech experience uh to you and and also there's something like the sequence of events matters too you 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 notice it uh first there's the fear an anticipation of a negative thing coming so you're already your brain's already saying okay now imagine you know the feeling that something bad is about to happen. It shows you that it, I swear to God, I turned that off. <laughs> well, That's I, how I, I did it. I, I spilled my what coffee. I'm coughing into the microphone. It's a, it's a mess today. I left the fan on fantastic. Best episode ever. <laughs> 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 oh, um, so yeah. So your brain's saying, imagine you anticipate something negative happening and now here let me show it to you in this form with with the leeches and then specifically the idea that they're going from somewhere near your elbow but towards towards your hand and it's when they're halfway there you get this blade and you're like i'm gonna cut them out and they make it all the way to your wrist before you wake up there's something in that sequence of events that makes 
that, that your brain's trying to process something specific through that imagery. When, when you think of it that way of, of a sequence of events over time, maybe the idea that it's moving towards your, towards your hand. I don't know. Do you work with your hands or, um, I, I don't know. I, I would say that I just, um, when I'm speaking, I use my hands. Like I just use hand gestures. You probably see me doing a lot of that on camera. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Okay. Maybe, I mean, if that association popped to mind, we can go with it too. So there's something about social interactions that are represented by gestures and, and there's something in your one mode of expression that is, that is say corrupted by this thing inside that you don't want out. I mean, we, we could just jump straight to the conclusion and say the leeches are your, your sense of wishing you weren't so introverted. Uh, and, and, but the idea that it was such a drastic threat, uh, I, it almost, it almost feels like it's something else because that's so extreme. You weren't just uncomfortable. You, you've got this intense experience. Then again, it can be your emotions around this are so intense. This, this fear of, ending a conversation poorly and, and being awkward socially feels like leeches inside you. So I don't know which direction you want to go with that. Is this, do you think it's something more intense or you think we kind of nailed it down to that's, that's the experience you were trying to process. What, what do you think? Um, well, yeah, I do feel the sense of like not wanting to be an introvert, like wishing that I could just change who I am. And kind of like not wanting to accept that maybe I am just an introvert and that's okay. Yeah. Maybe that is that sense of self accept acceptance that I'm having trouble with. But yeah, growing up, I just really wish I was social and just could, you know, kind of have like an idea, just let it come out of my ass and just go with it <laughs> and it'd be okay. For sure. Yeah. And, and, and so many other people make it look, look effortless. And for them, it may be, it may be precisely, that's just, it just flows for them. That's the flow. I uh, envy those people. Right? I really do. Honestly. Yeah. And it is interesting that you, even though you, uh, let's see, you, you, you notice you have the sense of dread, you notice the tickle, you look under the skin, there's something that doesn't belong there. You go to cut it out, but you don't actually cut it out. And it is also interesting that you call for help but the friends who were with you did nothing. So there's something in that dynamic too. Have you tried to reach out to some of your friends or close circle or family and tell them, look, this is just kind of how I am. I'm just not very life of the party. I'm more quiet and, and that's okay. And, and did they understand or do they still persist in this idea that, but it's not right. There's something wrong with you. No. Um, actually I have never brought it up. Okay. Like it, it's something that, I just, it, I toil with it in my brain, but no, I never actually said those words out loud. Like I wish I could be someone else. Gotcha. Gotcha. You wish, um, and, and be someone else uh, specifically, um, have ha naturally possess and display different qualities than, than you do. Uh, is that, is that more yeah. accurate? What was that again? Oh, uh, so there's the idea of becoming someone else, which is a whole, but that's a whole thing. But then there's also, I just wish there were natural parts of me that were different. It's more, more along those lines. Like yeah. you, you don't want to be a completely different person. You're just like, maybe these few things, if I tweak them a bit, I would be happier. Yeah. It's like that. Fair, fair enough. Fair enough. And that is interesting too. And I, I'm glad you brought that up. You said, you know, it's very often in your dreams, you are not you, but it is you. Yes. That's yes. interesting too. When you think about that in relation to what we've been talking about, where does, where does that go in your mind? In my mind? Yeah. Um, what does it bring up? Anything. It doesn't matter. Just that I can turn it on and off. This whole um, fluidity of being a conversationalist. Interesting. So it's a skill you've acquired. Didn't come naturally, but you've kind of adapted. You've kind of learned how to get by better. It's a coping skill though, but it's something you have to actively use. It doesn't come naturally. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And it is interesting too that, um, I keep saying that, but it's all fascinating to me. I love, I love this stuff, uh, that you called for help and no one did anything. So there might be a part of you that's saying, 
even if I scream, I'm having a problem. No, nope, nobody's going to listen. No one's going to do anything. Does that resonate? That does resonate. You don't feel like uh, you're going to get a lot of support in this issue, even if you do, but you've never brought it up. So, uh, never tried to explain to people. I just prefer to be alone and that's me and it's okay. No, I've never brought it up because I was just, um, just, I don't, this idea was forced onto me mm. where I just needed to be prepared to be social or that I should be social and have all of these ideas and topics of conversation mm. that just, you know, yeah, yeah, come out, that they should just be able to come out and they, they should be there. And now that I think about it, whenever I'm in social situations and put this amounts of pressure onto myself, there's nothing going on in my brain. Like there's no words, no thoughts, just me being there lifeless and in, in front of this person or this group of people. Interesting. I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of where to go, where to go with that in my brain, but that's it. Maybe I just need to process it myself a little bit. Uh, it's good to, to understand that experience, to kind of, take it out of your head and look at it and go, okay, this is what, this is what I see. This is what I'm experiencing. And sometimes that's what dreams are doing too. They're saying, look, look at yourself, look at this thing that's going on in your head. Um, I wonder, uh, I mean, well, here's, here's something you could do if, depending on how, how comfortable you are with it, you could show people this video. Uh, you could say, Hey fam, I, uh, I've been struggling with something. I want you to understand it. Watch, watch this and they can hear this story and they can hear what you've been struggling with. And it might start a conversation easier than you trying to organize your thoughts and go and tell them personally one-on-one. -on -one. I'm not saying you can't, uh, you should, or I recommend it, but it's, and how do you feel in general about starting that conversation about telling people, you know, I was just kind of born enjoying time alone and it's nothing personal and I love you and I will come to your baby shower, but I'm just kind of quiet. It's just kind of me. And, and it's okay. Uh, how, how do you feel about having that conversation with people? I feel like it would definitely help. Instead of me trying to articulate myself and tell them like, hey, this is who I am. It's better that I show them. Because I've always been an, a visual person as well. Gotcha. Like yeah. that's how I learn. That's how I process things. Mm -hmm. Never auditory, just visual. Me too. You know, very, very much so very heavy on the, on the visual side of things. I have a better visual memory. Like if you want to want me to remember something, I can, if I write it down, what I see, what my memory is, is I see the, the image of the words on the page that I wrote down. So take like taking notes in school was always a big thing for me. Um, but just listening to it, not, not so much. Yeah, no, it's not going to stay in there. It's nope. going to go fit in and cut out. Cut out the other. Yeah. Yeah. No, there was an old quote I heard once upon a time. Um, I, hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do and I understand. I always love that quote. That's it's kind of that um, audio, visual, tactile learning styles in a way, but you put all three of them together and you're really like in the whole experience and, and you don't just, you don't just hear about it. You don't just see it happen. You do it with your own hands and you're like, now I get it. Uh, I like you that. You say that one more time, that saying? Oh yeah, yeah. It is, I hear and I forget. I see and I remember, I do and I understand. Oh, wow. Yeah, I love that. Oh, that goes back. Like, when did I hear that? 30 yeah. years ago? It's kind of amazing. Yeah. Old old Chinese say, expression or something, I think. I don't know. Someone's going to come back and say, oh, that was Korean. Uh, fair enough. I, <laughs> I, don't, I, don't remember, I don't remember where it came from. Could have been. It could have been anywhere. Um, yeah. But now that um, it's coming to mind. Mm-hmm. This has always been a struggling thought that I've um, internalized, you know, being scrutinized for being the person that I actually am. So it was kind of, I've always played a role in things, you know, played a role in my family, played a role in my friends, in school, at my job but never actually showing the person that I truly am. And I had a hard time accepting that. 
That's something you've been thinking about lately, just that general pattern. And and I'm going through this um, journey of like self-discovery and like self-awareness. I feel like this dream came at a perfect time. Yeah. And this interview came at a perfect time. Oh, that that's that makes my heart sing. I love that. Just the idea that uh, you would have important thoughts and important experience relating to those thoughts, and then get to talk to someone about it and kind of wrap your brain around it. What what happened? What what is this? What is it? What does it all mean? That's and that I could be even even just a facilitator, even just a friendly ear. I I love that. I love it so much. <laughs> that's why I got. That's why I got into psychology. But yeah, like it's something. I feel that it's time for it to come out, you know, time for me to say it out loud to the people in my life. Yeah. And maybe this, you know, this video is, you know, uh, a way of me introducing that idea to these people that have quote unquote known me all my life. Yeah. And you know, it's perfectly, I want to, I want to normalize this experience too. So even going back to, Oh, since forever, but, but Carl, Carl Jung, I think said it best is with the idea of our, the, the masks we wear, the persona. So we, we take on different roles in different situations. Um, so many different roles throughout our life. I mean, right now I'm, I am enacting the role of dream wizard, but I, I get off the, off the line with you and I'm going to go enact the role of house remodeler. And then I'm going to go enact the role of lawnmower. You know, there's all these different roles of parent or roles of police officer. There's, there's masks we wear that are normal and natural because we're conforming to the role to the situation we're playing um and that goes goes back to greeks and they would they would have the comedy and tragedy masks uh and people mm-hmm. wear different masks literally on stage to represent different characters um it's going somewhere with that oh so what wh- two things two things you probably want to remember in in talking to to friends and family is that you were never fake with anyone you just weren't right. comfortable right. being fully yourself because you felt pressure to conform to social situations, which again, it's completely normal. And there was a second thing. Um, Oh, you can, and then as a part of um, sharing this and expressing it with people, it's like my introversion is not maybe call it shyness. Fine. I'm, I'm kind of shy and quiet in conversation. That doesn't matter, but a lot of people don't get the distinction, but you're, you are not disinterested. You, it's not like you don't care. It's it's the level of human social interaction you can tolerate before you're just drained emotionally, energy wise, and, right. and 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 that it's a biological thing. So yeah, so those those two things are very important. It's like I I love you to death. I'm never gonna uh, uh, not never, but I, I'm very rarely going to to speak to anyone ever. And so it's not just you. But then also I was never false or fake with anyone. I just was uncomfortable saying I felt awkward always everywhere <laughs> all the time that's the big thing that I want to point out that I was never fake with mm-hmm. you know that interaction it was just seeing you know dipping my toes first before I actually dove right in mm-hmm. and actually um shared myself with the person or just let that person know who I was. I'm, I rather just sit back and observe first. And then if there's something that I would like to contribute, then I would, you know, make my pre- and assert myself. For sure. But no, being fake was, that never has, that has, that thought has never crossed my mind. And it kind of angers me, to be honest, that, people make these assumptions of like, oh, you're fake. Oh, you're a shy and you're antisocial. No, I just take my time with these things. You know, I like to feel them out first before I actually, it's kind of like trying on this outfit Mm -hmm. before you actually purchase it. I would like to try it on first before I make the decision of. For sure. Yeah. (laughs) I was trying to think of good, uh, good analogies too. And one of it might be, um, uh, it's so biological, this is a very much a biological thing. The, the introvert extrovert thing, it's how, just how your brain was wired from birth. And there's not much you can do to, to well, nothing. You can, I won't say there's nothing you can do to change it, but there's, 
there is nothing you can do to change the biology. There's behavioral things you can force yourself to do, whether you want to or not, whether it works well for you or not. Those are two, two separate things. But a good analogy might be, I mean, if you look at me on, on camera, I'm a pasty white boy. I burn quickly in the sun. It's just biologically, I cannot tolerate too much sunshine or my skin gets a sunburn. There's other people with darker skin who can tolerate much more sunlight and it does not hurt them physically the same way. So that's a good analogy to some people are just born more susceptible to the pressures of social interaction and need more time alone. Very much biological. Um, so it's, it's definitely, or some people born, uh, cannot, uh, lactose intolerant. You don't hate milk. You can't drink it. It gives you the runs. What are you going to do? You know, it's, 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 uh, can't help it. yeah, yeah. It's just, uh, it is literally physical. It's not, something you can change uh, necessarily it's behavioral stuff but 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 the tendency yeah yeah it does not it does not actually contain the negative assumptions that a lot of people would make about it oh you just don't like me i love you i love you dearly i can't see you more than once a month i i, I look forward to seeing you when i do but I can't see every day. I can't talk every day. That's too much. It's more than I can physically tolerate. Uh, so it's a good distinction for people to understand. Right. And that's the, um, that's also an idea that I wish people um, would accept to just know about that. Oh, give me a moment here. I kind of lost my turn up that. It's okay. It happens all the time to me. <laughs> um just why can we come to an understanding that that this is the person who I am? Why, like, why can you just accept that this this is who I am? This, and yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. You know, we're all different people. We're all different flowers. I like that analogy as yeah, well. I you do. know, yeah. We're you're a different flower. Your petals are different. Your stem is different, mm -hmm. and so it's fine. So why can't we just you know enjoy each other's time yeah, instead of the change even better yeah. analogy yeah plants is like some plants need more shade some plants need more water some plants need more sunlight and you can't force a rose to be a tomato it's not gonna happen it's exactly it's <laughs> different diff different things that's good wow can you can you believe we had this whole conversation out of, out of what how long did that uh, dream felt like in inside of it felt like it took 15 30 minutes tops Right. And here we got like almost hour and hour and 15 minute conversation about it. It didn't even feel that long. It was, I, I came in and then I, next thing I knew I was coming out. Mm -hmm. But wow. All yeah. of that. Yeah. Oh, these things are amazing. This, this is why I love the dream interpretation thing. So there's a lot of people that do, I don't think there's anyone that I've been able to find that does exactly what I do. I do. This is very, reality scientific based um analysis of physical biological brain phenomenon connected to your life very psychology there's other people that are that do the um this is a message from god let me tell you all about it stuff nothing against those folks it's not my style i I'm, <laughs> I, I i like it a little more concrete you know that's uh, exactly more tangible yeah more tangible can we, what can we, what sense can we make and i've never been yeah i was saying this to the last guy i talked to um oh brain brain now michael i think it might have been his name he's gonna hate me sorry sorry buddy um anyway last last guy I just talked to uh video just dropped the other day um oh i had a point there too uh I'm trying to remember his name shot me in the foot oh, was, what was, was i talking about oh um, it was related to like the life experiences and oh yes that um those uh uh, that you like more tangible, more concrete ideas rather than the hand of God. Yeah. No, I had a point there. It was it was genius. Just trust me. It was, whatever I was gonna say was awesome. <laughs> we'll just we'll just pretend I said something profound. <laughs> <laughs> but I guess maybe just down down to the tangible level of, of stuff too is like hopefully from this experience you've got something you can use going forward a better understanding of yourself a way forward in your interactions a, a, a chosen path professionally I mean that, that these the, these dream experiences like maybe that was my point these dream experiences don't have to be supernatural to be extremely important and my phone's ringing again. Scam likely. That's my favorite repeat caller. Scam likely. <laughs> anyway, um, 
getting down to wrapping it up. These things don't have to have to take forever, but do you feel we've covered the bases on all the discrete images and experiences in the dream? We kind of put something together or do you want to talk about something more? Uh, it's completely, completely up to you. I guess just, just the idea of like, why couldn't I take them out? Why didn't it happen in the dream that I was able to take these leeches out? And it wasn't until that I woke up, uh, they stayed in my arm in that dream. Yeah, those are two important experiences. I was getting to that kind of with the noticing it, deciding to do something about it, but they made it here and you never actually got them cut out. So what is what does it mean that that didn't happen? It very well could have been that you did make a slice and not even any blood, but they just wiggled out and fell on the ground. And so you were able to change it. Maybe my thought going through this conversation with you is because this has been such a, an innate lifelong um, personality trait in a way for you. And, and uh, that you've struggled with it for so long as you see it as something you cannot remove, even if you don't like it, even if you find it horrifying that it's inside you, that it causes you so much pain and anxiety. Um, that could be the symbology of not actually going through with the motion to cut it out is, is your brain is saying you want to, you, you want to have a knife in your hand, but actually getting rid of it. No, you just can't. That might, now that I think might about be. it in the dream, um, I was prepared, you know, to slice my skin open and take these, uh, little bastards out, but yeah. no, I just, but it didn't happen. And you you didn't you didn't feel like something stopped you from doing it like you didn't hesitate you just didn't have enough time uh, they yeah got, I didn't have enough time that that seems to, to to my mind that that sequence of events is that suggests that uh, you feel like there's nothing you can actually do despite desperately wanting to um, to the to the point of having a knife and just not not enough time to use it uh, the the chance never presented itself in, in a timely manner to, to get it done. Um, um, what comes to mind yeah. is that if I do go through, you know, um, showing people this interview or just in general speaking about being an introvert. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> dang, I lost it. Um, we're talking about not having enough time to get it out, something you can't actually change. Did that spawn the thought? Um, maybe I'm not as prepared as I think I, I am or... Oh, yes, I remember. Um, I have this feeling that maybe they still won't understand or that they still won't accept who I actually am. Yeah. So then... There's no point in saying anything. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I, I won't lie to you. That's a realistic possibility that there are some people who can't get it, won't get it, don't care to get it. Um, in some ways, there's a, I know, there's a lot of different ways to look at that. You'll hear some people say, well, you just, you be you. And if they don't like you, that's on them and whatever. Uh, that's great advice for uh, someone who's a little more, fiery in, in their temperament and, uh, I don't want to say naturally extroverted, but, it, but, but more of those, like, I'm just mean, if you can't deal with it, whatever, uh, there's a, there's a lot more, it's not inner strength. It's not self-confidence necessarily, but it's, it's like those folks, they don't have the same negative emotional trauma of telling people by Felicia. Um, some, some of us are more sensitive to that and that's just how we are. So, um, I'm validating the idea that yes, there might be some people who can't get it and don't care to get it, but but the but the the majority of people will probably be um, on the side of you know, oh, I understand and they accept it, or I don't get it, but I love you anyway, and whatever, you're just weird and and you're right, your family, yeah. you're my friend, and like that's what I love to telling people I'm I'm just a weirdo, I'm just maybe you know, I feel like that that whole bringing my um, bringing that blade towards my arm thing is the analogy of me saying those words or getting through that uncomfortable situation. I mean, conversation. Yeah. Cause there, there was a reaching out. There was a screaming for help in the dream. Do get, get this out of me and no one does anything. And there's 
part of that that makes me think it's because you got to do it yourself. You, yes. Nobody yes. else can. Yeah. No one, no one else can take the leeches out of you. <laughs> you got to, you got the knife. You yeah. got to do it. No, not for me. You know, I got to do it yeah. myself, you know, but yeah. But you, I can, do everything. but you can ask for help. And that's, I would separate that out as well, that sometimes we have these dream experience of here's what we're afraid of. I scream for help and no one responds. And that's legit. That's a real feeling. But how real is that in the real world? How many of your close friends or family are going to treat you poorly by opening up a little more? Uh, do, you, do you get the feeling that even if they don't understand it, they might probably still be kind or, um, you know, uh, supportive in their own I way? I know how to act, you know, because they had this idea of me in their heads for so long mm -hmm. that now I'm trying to change the narrative and they that, just don't want to. That can be, that can be a little tough. <clears throat> that's, that's why I spoke about the idea of, you know, being prepared for the idea that someone might, might misunderstand and say, what, you were just being fake or something. Um, but it's, but it's more of the long, along the lines of saying, here's how I've always felt on the inside. And I've tried to put a brave face on it. I've tried to live up to what I believe were my, social obligations in this sense. And it's, it's been a struggle. It's been very hard. And I think I've done it. I mean, a lot of I messages, I feel this way. I think I've done this poorly to the best of my ability, but God, I just feel awkward and I don't know what to do with my hands and, and I never know what to say. And I always worry, you know, to, I worry that people think I'm not interested because I have nothing to respond, but I'm just thinking and listening. Um, a lot of those, a lot of those messages go a long way in, in helping people, feel that they're not being attacked as if they did something wrong. You know, they, no one did anything to you necessarily. Their expectations are their own. Um, but your ability to respond or live up to it is, is what you're trying to explain, so to speak. Exactly. Yes. And that so resonates with me. Um, even the whole process of putting the words together, putting those sentences together, I struggle with a lot. Sometimes I even feel I have, I don't know, some sort of communication disorder or something because those social situations really just suck the life out of me. And I feel like language, you know, is so complex and so broad that how do I pick and choose the right words that I want to use to articulate myself and yeah. kind of make understand where I'm coming from? Yeah. It's, I've, I've mentioned this before too. Uh, and I, I, I think Joe Rogan had a, had a bit about this, that we're just monkeys communicating psych psychically. And it's like, I make sounds with my mouth and you have images in your head and you understand what I'm saying. It's like, what is that? How is that even possible? It's my, my brain neurons and your brain neurons and something happens in between us and they, are they the same? Maybe they are, you know, I say apple, you get a picture of an apple. It's like, that just happened. You, we didn't have to, we can't control it. It just, it's just a process that is, there, there, there's something else too. This is, um, I don't know if I've ever talked about this, but like there's four, um, four, I'll use my other hand here, four stages to <laughs> communication and, and communication can break down at any stage. There's what you think about a thing. There's how you put it into words. There's what the other person hears and then how they process and understand that auditory message. There's a minimum of four opportunities for everything to go horribly wrong. And there has to be, I think, a, a, an intentional desire to receive a message correctly in order to not have it completely break down in one of those four stages. Um, that That's, well, you see it on social media and uh, all the time someone says something and it's kind of vague and like a dozen people jump all over it and say, you're an idiot. Yeah. Well, how about you ask me, is this what you meant? Uh, and I might say, yeah, that's a much better way to put it. That is what I meant. Or I might say, no, no, oh, wow, you got it all wrong. That's not what I meant at all. Let me try different words. Um, and that's what I worry about all the time, yeah. you know, that somehow along those lines, my message to that person would just get misconstrued and then I lose them. And then they have this thought and idea that yeah. sticks with them. And then there's nothing I can do to change that. Like that has always been a worry for me. For sure. That's very true. Well, and that, I think that comes with different levels of confidence, but ability 
and natural tendency with with social situations as well as I it's almost a funny thing where extroverts seem more comfortable with other people but in a way care less what other people think broadly not not specifically but but introverts are kind of the opposite way is we we care so much about what other people think that we don't want to say the wrong thing and sometimes we don't say anything at all that's also the, in in the in the shyness and and anxiety side of things is that that comes up because we're so uncomfortable with with the interaction that it ah, we, we don't know if we're doing it right or not and and we care whether we do it right or not and it's like oh now what do i do i'm frozen uh, <laughs> yeah. and yeah i've been the type of person where like i just want to get it right at least once just let me yeah. get it right yeah and but. there's there's part of it as well where it's also learning to be a, to go a little easier on yourself and like not the end of the world someone misunderstands you say sorry that's i said it wrong yeah. or you know it's you know probably no one's going to hate you for life unless you try to kill their mother you know that kind of thing it's, it's got to be something <laughs> drastic <laughs> no but yeah that's something i'm slowly accepting you know coming to terms with that that other person those group of people may not understand where i'm coming from and that's perfectly okay yeah Something to uh, be aware of po the possibility for and and accept that uh, that indeed may happen. On the other side, that it's also very unlikely that if you've got friends who care about you, at least that's what they've shown you uh, throughout throughout knowing them, that they'll be at least willing to listen and try to understand and you know that they're not looking for an opportunity to misunderstand they're not looking for an opportunity to treat you poorly um so that's a good thing to remember as well it's, you know your friends are probably not gonna they may jokingly give you a hard time but they're probably not gonna turn on you suddenly because you're like i, I kind of prefer to be alone most of the time that's where i'm happy and that's again those i messages this is how i feel this is what makes me happy this is what i need to feel comfortable and then it's all just sharing what you feel and um, no one feels attacked or like they did anything wrong. That's a, that's a big deal. Right. Yeah. Those I messages, man, sometimes they make you feel like you're selfish or something, but yeah. no, it's just generally. I get that. I get that too. Yeah. Well, who am I to say what I feel as if it matters? Oh yeah. Right. <laughs> I, I, you know, I get it. I get it. And, and it does and it doesn't. I mean, but, but then uh, it's a reci reci reciprocation too, because um, now they can tell you how they feel and you're going to listen and you're going to be hopefully equally accepting um, and then, you know, negotiate it out. Uh, yeah. I've, I've, I've taken throughout my life to saying, uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm, I'm not coming to the party, but I, but I like being invited. Thank you. It's nice. You reached out and wanted me to be included and I'll see you next time. But I, I don't enjoy those things and I don't want to do that. And I love you the same, you know, and there's some people I don't see as often as I used to because uh, for, for one reason or another, but no, no one ever cut me off as, as a friend because I didn't come to a party. Uh, so I'm just like, nah, it's not my scene. Not what I enjoy. Not, not where I feel comfortable. I love you dearly. I'm I'm not coming. <laughs> yeah, that's just me. Yeah, but wow, I don't all of this dream of a party and leeches. Right, that's and and you just threw it up on Reddit, and I, I came across it and sent you a message, and and now you're here doing this thing, and that's that's amazing too that these things happen. I don't know what's going on with my life the whole last year. I've had these amazing conversations with people. I love it. It seems yeah. like seems like magical to me. So. <laughs> I'll just through the power of conversation, you know, yeah. deep thoughts and these, I don't know, these dreams, these crazy ass dreams. <laughs> oh yeah. More important than some people realize people think, oh, dreams, whatever. And it's like, well, yeah, for you, maybe not, not as important, but uh, for other folks, if that's, that's what I've said before too, if, a, if you wake up from a dream and it leaves a strong impression, a strong feeling, that was the other thing we're going to get to is you mentioned, you know, um, the leech and the, the idea that you woke up with that feeling there, that can be nothing more than, um, okay. So not nothing more than, uh, that that's half the conversation. So what, how do we hear anything <clears throat> tree falls in the forest? So physically large object contacts the ground and that smack 
is vibrates the air, rattles our eardrum down the auditory nerve. The hearing actually takes place in the center of the brain that the auditory nerve is, is connected to. That's when we hear something. So what's going on in our sleep is all of those areas of hearing, seeing, feeling, tasting, touching, all the sensations, those areas are lighting up while we're disconnected from our body. So I had a point with this. Damn it. <laughs> oh, the sensation crossing over into wake. So what what is happening in that, what I believe is happening in that borderland state of crossing from sleeping to waking up is that area of your brain that's triggering tactile sensations, which actually in dreams, pretty rare. Visuals, auditory, more common than tactile uh, smell uh, stuff uh, in dreams. But that that area of the brain is still kind of lit up a little bit as you're becoming awake and that sensation stays with you a little bit, but faded almost immediately. Like you're like, Oh, what the hell you look, nothing's there. And then it goes away. Yeah. It, it was kind of, yeah, it was like that, but never the, just the thought of the dreaming of leeches. Cause I don't believe I've ever dreamed of leeches before. Yeah. Very stuck with, oh, go ahead. Just that it, 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 um, stuck with me because mm-hmm. Oh, they're just creepy crawlies, you know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and that's probably something too, where th- there is a, uh, again, in that iconic movie monster or, or analogous where your brain often, or everyone's brain often thinks in, in analogies, here's something like what you're considering. Here's something that does the thing you're thinking about in some form. So vampires, leeches, things that draw off of you. And there is without being judgmental towards anyone else who just enjoys socializing. Um, let's say an extrovert who, who charges up from social interaction. They're not actually taking energy from someone else in any physical or metaphysical way. You have two, uh, extroverts. They're both charging each other up and no one's losing a thing. It's, it's a very personal internal thing to be drained by social interaction. And it isn't that anyone else is doing it to you. They're not actually taking anything from you. It's just that process drains you. So yeah. there is a very vampire like leechy feeding type of thing happening there where, where this energy is flowing out and you you can't stop it. You can't change it. It just, it is what it is. And it's at a certain point you're drained and you're just like, I can't, I can't anymore. I can't pay attention. Can't focus. Can't uh, give you more of me. I've given everything I can. Um, so you are not thinking of your friends and family as if they are leeches, but your, your brain is like, imagine this involuntary draining and, and, and it put it in that form of, of something inside you that you, would be disgusted by or would would want to remove if you could um if that makes sense yeah it it does make sense but no it's not something that i feel they're taking from me mm-hmm. or using me yeah and no, they're not, for sure no process, you know, it's just the whole process of being social and contributing to something that necessarily maybe at the time i'm just I've had enough and that's okay until next time. You know, it's not like it's a goodbye. It's until next time. Yeah. Yeah. It's more of a, what is it? I watch too much anime, but the, when, when it's like, see you later, they say, uh, Jana. And when it's, this is the final goodbye, it's sayonara. I, sayonara. I will never see you again. That's why now just see, see you next time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I watch a lot of anime. Yeah. It's good stories. <laughs> You know, once, I don't know if you've watched any at all, and I don't know if anyone cares, but uh, for the longest time, I've avoided popular series. I like the little off-brand stuff, one-offs, 12, 12 episodes. I started watching Bleach. I like it. It's actually pretty good. Typical power-up um, shonen style anime. But anyway, that's yeah. way off way off on a tangent. Nothing to do with Not your dream. Really with anime. Yeah. But I've, I, there's some, you know, that, do speak i mean um spark an interest mm-hmm. and sometimes people just i don't know they kind of ruin it for other people because it's like oh my god this is so amazing yeah. you should watch it. and it, it just gets too much i um used i don't know if that's the right word or just yeah to, to, yeah. over overhyped and t- t- too much talked yeah. about and people are obsessed with it and then yeah that's well that's why i tend to avoid some of the some of the more 
popular, <laughs> popular ones. Like I'm, I'll probably get around to checking them out. Like Bleach, I res- resisted for a long time, but I don't know if I'm ever going to get in like Naruto or uh, Last Airbender or any of that stuff. Well, maybe, maybe, maybe well, someday I'll go. Why did I wait so long? This is amazing. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, back to back to you and the reason you're here. Um, do you feel like we kind of? got the big picture on this got the story arc got a got an understanding and gave you maybe some tools to move move forward on some of this stuff yeah i feel like we got really well-rounded to everything every you know um specifics that kind of shot out but yeah all right good deal yeah i i um these things don't have to take forever. Uh, I've gone three and a half hours, I think, with one guy, just because there were more details, more things he wanted to talk about. I'm in, I'm in for the ride. So, um, always um, like to check with folks and make sure they've they've had a satisfactory experience. They got what they they got what they came for. So, yeah, this was honestly a really interesting and helpful experience. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, okay. Well, if you feel uh, satisfied, I will I will call it good, and uh, I'll do I'll wrap it up, and we'll talk for a moment afterwards. Okay, yeah, sounds good. All right, good deal. Well, uh, on that note, everybody, hey, that's another episode of Dreamscapes. Thanks for joining us. And and once again, of course, thanks to our friend uh, Kim from uh, New Mexico. I don't know if I mentioned that, but um, thanks thanks for coming and sharing your dream with us. Thank you. Glad to be here. Glad yeah, to have been here. For sure. And I'm going to go through the, uh, hey, please like, share, subscribe, tell your friends. I always need more volunteers for the dreams. Buy a t-shirt. Hey, they're snazzy. By the way, this is going to be a limited edition at some point because... I'm changing my logo design. So if you want the old Dreamscapes t-shirt, you got to get it now because I'm going to uh, got some surprises coming in that regard. Uh, of course, direct donation links in the description below. And I have currently nine books of historical dream literature available on Amazon, uh, number 10 on the way. And that's enough uh, shameless self-promotion. Thanks for listening.